Hi everyone, welcome back to The Bible Explained. Let's continue our study on Genesis chapter 3. The Temptation and Fall of Man Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand, and take also from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Okay, let's review chapter 3 of Genesis. There are several things we need to address in this chapter, such as the serpent, Will, the enemy, who was once known as Lucifer, a high-ranking angel who used to be a part of God's angels, a few things about Adam and Eve, the two trees, and God himself. First, let's touch on the serpent. The first verse of chapter 3 states, The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field that God has created. Now what would that mean 
if God looked upon all of his creation and saw that it was good? Well, it certainly doesn't mean this creature was a deceitful creature straight from the creation of God's hand, but this verse gives us insight on the ability of communication and intelligence from animal to man. This creature most likely had certain abilities that was most helpful to Adam. God said that Adam would have dominion over all creatures, have authority, and subdue the entire earth. We see this today, that we are able to domesticate animals, even extremely large land and aquatic animals listen to us, but it was very much different and simple in the very beginning of creation. When God fashioned the beast of the field and the fowl of the air, Adam not only witnessed God's creative work, but he was able to pick a helper so he wouldn't be alone, as we read in chapter 2. So the serpent was very crafty in technique and very useful for whatever Adam needed. This trait was later determined to be very useful by the enemy as a means of deceiving Eve, followed by Adam. And this brings us to the next point. Let's discuss the action of will. God has given Adam and Eve and all of mankind the right to choose to, to obey or disobey. And that's exactly free will. You may hear of discussions about God pre-programming Adam and Eve to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil so that he can later save them. Jumping over to the scripture Ephesians chapter 1 uh, verse 3 through 5 that has so many people believing this particularly the Calvinist group. It reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now this isn't saying we were already destined to sin and God scripted every bad thing and every good thing that we do. Uh, that would be a cruel and foolish God to give any acknowledgement to. Why give the very best of him, which is Jesus, his only begotten son, just to save a select few whom he predestined to sin and predestined the rest to suffer outside of the existence of God for eternity. For the Bible to be the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God, it cannot have contradicting passages that counters what Jesus says in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so going back to chapter 3 of Genesis, we see the enemy using the serpent to communicate with Eve to plant the very same deception that happened within the heart of Lucifer which we would discuss much later. Now, I would ask the question, why use the serpent, even if you see the serpent to be very crafty and cunning amongst all the other beasts? Now, this is just my opinion, and it is not canon or scriptural, but it just makes sense to me. Keep in mind that there are multiple writers of Genesis, but Moses is the one who composed all of the events from tablets that were passed down and of course God directing him on the right words to put down as a final draft. But my opinion is that God instructs Moses to not write that the serpent was more crafty than any other fowl of the air nor fish of the sea, but beast only. We classify beast in the animal kingdom as anything that has horns on his head or canine and scissor teeth. I believe the serpent was not a snake at first, but some type of four-legged creature, uh, because for God to say to the serpent, cursed are you above all other beasts or livestock, and you shall crawl and eat dust all of the days of your life, well, what position must you be in to receive that punishment? You'd have to be upright. And I also believe God's statement in verse 14 and 15 is twofold, meaning one sentence for two personalities, the creature and the enemy as well, reminding him that he is already defeated 
even after deceiving Adam and Eve to fall, handing over their dominion to the enemy. Now there is a reason why the enemy used the serpent instead of just going to Eve himself. He wielded the serpent of course because it was crafty but the Bible also describes some of the abilities that angels possess such as transformative ability. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Yes, for whatever assignment is assigned to an angel, whether it's for the glory of God or the deception of man via the work of the enemy's plan against us, they can transform from the angelic to looking like you and me. And so one of the reasons why I believe the angel did not appear to Eve in his true form or a transformative human form is because there were no other people on earth, just Eve and her husband at this time. And so that would completely throw everything off. It would have to be a creature that she's familiar with, who she trusts to be very wise and helpful to her husband. And so as the Apostle John states in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but is of the world. Eve is the first person to do this as Genesis chapter 3 states in verse 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Once again, we see how the enemy works by going after the most obvious one who would fall for such a deception, seeing that the woman would be the one to reason with most things. And Timothy confirms this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, fell into transgression. Adam knew clearly not to partake of the tree in the midst of the garden, and he ate of it anyway, acknowledging that he is the head of his wife, and that she is bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, honoring the one flesh union and not remaining separate from his wife. I pray that this speaks volume to men as husbands and the responsibility they hold with their wives. And so after sin has become one with Adam and Eve, knowing not only good, but evil as well, they start blaming others for their actions when God is clearly looking for a confession, not answers. He is all-knowing. He is just looking for a confession, which is familiar. If you confess your sins and trespasses, you may be healed, as stated in the book of James. God's questions to Adam shows his intent before God's only begotten son even shows up to save those who will willfully accept him. Another good point to notice for men regarding their marriage and decision making uh, when God speaks to you and shows you truth on how he wants you to lead your family, you must stick to it and not heed the voice of your wife, especially if she is against what it is. Looking into verse 17, then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it which leads to extreme work in the land which he didn't have to do before. If God's word backs up the direction in which God is entrusting you, the husband, to lead your family, then it is done. You must carry it out. You are the head and she is the body. You can trust that your wife is wise, but when you hear from God, it may not always be something the wife wants to stop or start doing. Keep her in prayer and eventually God will shape her heart to see. And this goes for the wife as well, being her husband's helper and promoting wisdom for him to lead. As we get down to verse 20, we see Adam naming his wife Eve after God gives her 
and all female the punishment of pain and childbearing as a reminder to heed the voice of your husband, which ultimately comes from uh, God himself. Eve means the mother of all living. Now, I just want to point out that there are scientists and even creation scientists who believe the word of God feel that there could be other life out there in the universe outside of the planets we can see. There are several scriptures that counters that theory, but just to mention two, one is right here, verse 20. If Eve is the mother of all living, and Earth is the only planet we tangibly can observe as the planet which holds life, then we are it. There are no other humans or terrestrial beings off planet Earth. The second scripture, which comes from the mouth of Jesus himself, is in Matthew 19, verse 4. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? If God made them male and female at the beginning of all human history, how can there be life elsewhere if earth had to exist first to provide water and land in order to fashion male and female out of? Is Jesus lying? I highly doubt it. This statement from Jesus also counters the divinity professor Thomas Chalmers who popularized the Genesis gap theory. And so as we get to the last verse of chapter 3 verse 24, God utilizes a specific hierarchy of angels called cherubim, which is exactly what the enemy is. And cherubim have four faces, so they are always moving forward and nothing escapes their sight. Uh, he places them in the midst of the garden to keep Adam and Eve and all man from being able to have access to both trees. Because if a descendant of Adam and Eve who is already in the sinful state eat of the tree of life, which represents immortality, then they will remain in that sinful state for all of eternity and salvation will not apply to that person. It is written that the wages of sin is death and partaking in the tree of life will place that person in an immortal state. And when God mentions to the enemy in verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God is providing the first gospel of the Bible and describing his contingency plan to redeem man back to him from remaining forever separate from him. Enmity is the Hebrew word Ebba, meaning hostility or hatred. And when God says, I will put hatred between you, the enemy, and her seed, which is Eve, he's talking about all those who would pursue righteousness, abstaining from sin, and all those who would pursue unrighteousness willfully doing whatever they want and the two sides would be battling each other when god says he shall bruise your head he is referring to jesus his son and when god says you shall bruise his heel he is referring to the enemy coming against jesus the enemy was clever enough to deduce that this is a seed prophecy that is to actually come and he quickly gathers his following of disobedient angelic brethren to tell several stories of immaculate conception so that when Jesus shows up approximately around year 3 AD he would seem to be a counterfeit because they've heard and seen uh, immaculate conception stories long ago. Well that's going to be our review of Genesis chapter 3. Go ahead and like this video Share with your friends, subscribe, and leave comments below. We'll see you in the next chapter.